So, uh, good evening, and thank you for joining us uh, for our webinar on Number Sense. I'd like to introduce myself briefly. Uh, my name is Nathan Austin. I'm the Curriculum and Online Training Director for Casio America, and I'm really excited to have a chance to work with all of our uh, our teacher advisors and and these webinars. John Nero, who is handling this one this evening. Uh, has a lot of wonderful experience, and uh, I'm glad to have had the chance to sit through some of his sessions myself. Um, I hate to actually read PowerPoints at you, so this is all available for you to read, but uh, I won't go through the whole thing. But uh, suffice it to say, John's got a lot of great experience, and hes uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy the webinar this evening. Uh, a quick bit of information, uh, for the sake of audio quality, you are all automatically muted. Um, we that's just to prevent you know the dog barking in the background or you know family interruptions etc if you do have a question you are welcome to type it into the question panel or the question pane rather and uh, I will respond back privately if possible and if it's something that does end up pertaining to the entire um, to the entire group then I will pass that on to John if you need immediate assistance, you can also raise your hand by clicking on the hand symbol in the upper left-hand corner. So without further ado, I want to hand this over to John. So Thanks, th Nathan. there you go, sir. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Nathan mentioned, if you do have any questions, feel free to um, post them in the pane, and he'll go ahead and ask, uh, answer them. Um, but certainly, Nathan and I have talked as well, so if we, uh, if we need to launch something out for the entire group, by all means, please go ahead and do so. Um, I am very happy to be with you tonight to talk to you a little bit about Number Sense. And the title of this webinar is Building a Number Sense Foundation, How Strong Can It Be? So Number Sense is very, very important to me. It is something that when I began my mathematics teaching career when I was um, in the middle school mathematics classroom. And then as I, as I progressed and ended up being a district mathematics coordinator for um, the Oakland Public Schools, um, which is a K-8 to district, and had an opportunity to um, serve in a, the district coordinatorship capacity. But what that really meant was it allowed me to be a curriculum specialist, a professional development provider, an instructional coach, and to go and visit classrooms, particularly at the elementary level, to really have vertical articulations with people I work with on a daily basis to talk about the things they were doing to create wonderful number sense opportunities for their students. And I think what's really exciting about where we are at right now in terms of mathematics education with the Common Core is that it has opened up a huge discussion on number. So what does number mean? What does it mean to quantify something? What does it mean to have a very strong sense about something that is one more or one less? Or what does it mean if something is a power of 10 more than another number? So these conversations, I think, are really, really vital to what we get to see as a very connected progression between what our K-5 mathematics teachers are doing in terms of uh, understanding and, and instilling that whole sense of number with those K-5 students, and then looking at the 6 to 8 grade band that we see in the Common Core around ratio and proportions and linear functions, and then looking at how our high school teachers are taking all of that information and instilling the work with numbers around real numbers and imaginary numbers and, and connecting all the way through, um, I think it's just a really, really exciting time for us. Um, I, I want to share just this little quick little anecdote. So I had an opportunity years ago. I was teaching an eighth grade Algebra one uh, class and began the year, and I asked my students to define for me what is number sense, and then also for them to evaluate 
and kind of self-assess a little bit how their number sense was. I just want to preface by saying these were students who, when we looked at a variety of data, were extremely well-versed in mathematics. Their scores were off the chart. And so asked them this question, they wrote their exit tickets, they turned them in at the end of the class, and I, and I started going through them. And I was really shocked to learn that some of my students felt that they didn't have very good number sense. For example, one student wrote, I don't have good number sense. I can't do math in my head. And another student who wrote, um, I'm OK with number sense, but I really struggle with times tables over 12. OK, well, I'm a firm believer that we need to know our basic facts, but I have to admit that even I'm a little rusty with my 16 times table. So, um, so there was that component. But the one that stood out for me very, very clearly was the student who wrote, I don't have good number sense. If you were to ask me to add 56 plus 9, I couldn't do it without taking 4 from that 9 and adding it to 56 to make 60, and then adding that additional 5 to get a sum of 65. I don't have good number sense. Think about that. That was the best answer I got from any of my students that year. And I remember I, 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 I asked her in class, and she said, oh, please don't call on me. And I said, that was the best answer, because that's the kind of numerical reasoning that we're looking for. That's the kind of thing that we want our students to be able to understand, and the kind of conversations that we want to engage them in. And so that really grounds this conversation today. So think about the kind of activities that you're doing in your classroom, that your, your teammates at your grade level are doing, or your fellow colleagues are doing. Think about the kind of activities that are promoting discussion around number sense. As you're thinking about that, um, and, and this is where um, I, I think the point has to be made very, very strongly as far as I'm concerned, is that um, I personally am a firm believer that kids need to know their basic facts. Kids need to know how to fluently add, subtract, and multiply, and divide. Kids need to understand that when they go out to a store and they buy something that's on sale and the sign says 20% off, that they're either A, able to do that in their head, or B, they are able to get a very good estimate when they go to the register so as fiscally responsible consumers, they know what they're spending and what they're paying for something. So it's these kind of quote unquote real world experiences or real world applications that what we see in the common core about automaticity and fluency I think is really, really important um, and, and feel very strongly about that. But I also believe that a calculator is a wonderful, wonderful tool. And it is a wonderful tool that allows us to kind of enhance the problem solving process. So I want to just spend a little bit of talking about an activity that, uh, that I, I personally love doing in the classroom, and that is the four fours activity. So this is kind of hard for me because, you know, normally I would just ask and say, how many of you have ever done four fours activity? Um, and, uh, uh, and perhaps maybe some of you have or some of you haven't. Um, but for those of you that haven't, um, this activity is very simple. It is a game of that means that we are going to use four fours to create a series of numerical expressions that equal a particular number. So for example, um, if I wanted to uh, use four fours to create, say, eight, I could use addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, or I could use any other um, operation or symbol, but I can only use four fours to equal, for example, the number eight. So how might you do it? Well, one thing that immediately comes to mind is I might do four 
plus 4, plus 4, minus 4. So there's my expression. That equals 8. Could there be another way that I could do 8? Um, think about that. Is there another way that I could use four fours to create 8? Well, I know one of the things that, that um, in my classroom my kids, my students would do a lot is they would just switch the symbols around. So they would do 4 minus 4 plus 4. And they would do that. So if I see these two examples that are here, they yield the same answer. Um, that could promote maybe a, a, a very, very short discussion on order of operations and how when we add or subtract in order from left to right, um, when we look at the order of operations, that this will still yield the same sum. So what if I wanted to get one more than eight? What if I wanted to use four fours to equal nine? Could you think of a way that we could use four fours to equal nine? And I'll give you a little bit of time, a few seconds here to think about that. You know, I'll, I'll take a moment here, John, just to interject that, uh, sure. you know, they do have the ability to raise their hands and uh, also to, yeah, okay. to feed me uh, any questions. So, you know, it's not necessarily easy to do a lot of uh, question and response, but if you do want input, uh, we can certainly arrange that. Okay. Um, I think that actually would be kind of nice if, if we could just maybe solicit um, some of that. Um, you have access to see that, but I don't, correct? Yeah, you might, but it's 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 easy for me. You know, it's, uh, what am I trying to say? I don't know exactly what you have in front of you. <laughs> okay, I've got, I've got I can see the control panel um, up, um, and I don't know if you're seeing that well since I'm sharing my screen. No, I don't see that. Uh, but do you have a little pane that says questions? That I, I don't have. I see. I don't have. What about the top? Does it say view file options view? I see file view and help. Yeah, and under view, there should be a way to toggle um, questions. There's a at least on mine. I don't I know. Don't have that. You don't have that. Yeah. So maybe it's that just I me. Don't. So I can feed them to you if anybody. Okay. So far, no one's actually fed them to me. But uh, okay. So so let me go ahead then, and we'll throw we'll throw in this example. So we've got four plus four, and then we're going to do four over four. That's going to equal 9. So one of the things that I really like to do with this activity is that once, once my students understood the parameters of the activity and they knew that they could only use four fours, and if you've never done this in the classroom, if you have done this with your students, you know that kids are inquisitive, they're going to want to ask a lot of clarifying questions. And, and part of the lift in this activity is to be very strong and simply saying you can only use four fours. But you want to ensure that students are thinking a little bit outside the box. So if a student says, well, can I do four over four? Well, what does four over four equal? Well, that equals one. Well, okay, so if I'm using four over four, that then means that I'm using two of my four fours. So what would I do with the other two? Well, in this case, we see four plus four plus four over four, which will equal nine. But if I did four minus four plus four over four, now I get one. Okay? So just the whole concept as we're, as we're thinking about number and building some number sense, that what I've done is I've taken two fours, I've used four over four, that equals one. Well, I've just done two examples that help me to get an odd answer or an odd, um, an odd response here. So 
one of the things I would say to them is, well, okay, so you've done 4 over 4. Could you ever use 4 over 4 to get an even response? And hopefully pretty quickly they'll say, well, yeah, because you can just do 4 plus 4 over or, or um, 4 fourths plus 4 fourths, and that'll equal 2. I strongly suggest that you, you spend some time pulling some information from students about how they're using 4 fourths. So one of the questions comes up, well, can I do 44? Well, yeah, if I do 44 divided by 44, that'll equal 1. Um, but I could do some other things, too. I could do 44 minus 4 minus 4. That would give me 36. And then someone will say, well, can I do square root? Absolutely. What happens when I take the square root of 4? Well, that equals 2. So when we were talking before about getting 8, what does it look like then if a student did square root of 4 oops, plus square root of 4 plus the square root of 4 plus the square root of 4? Yeah, that equals 8. Um, be careful. Sometimes you will have students that will kind of get caught a little bit in um, writing twos um, that are not part of the answer. And we want to instill the fact that this is all about four fours. Um, what we could also do is what happens then if my students see this. So now, if I take the square root of 16, that'll equal 4. I can't write 16, but I can write it as 4 times 4. So encourage those, those different kind of uses. The other thing is that I can't do 4 squared, because the fact that we're squaring something means it's 2, and I can't use a 2. But what I could do is I could say, What about 4 to the square root of 4 power? That gives me 16. So that becomes another way of using a mathematical symbol in using 4 fours. So if I did 4 to the square root of 4 plus 4 to the square root of 4, that'll equal 32. One of the, um, one of the great, um, great things is, is, is try to get 19. Think, think for a moment about how you could get 19 using four fours. Um, and as you're thinking about that, I always found this to be a great activity to do right at the beginning of the year. Or if I had a few minutes at the end of class, especially on a Friday, and was just looking to, to fill a little bit of time and build some, some um, number sense. So um, I would give this activity at the beginning and all, and they'd go home and they, you know, kind of, some, some kids would ask their parents and they, you know, go back and forth and, and it would usually give them a range of numbers, like solve for 1 to 10 or solve for 11 to 20. 19 always got them stuck. And the only way that I've been able to find that you could actually do, um, do 19 is to use a factorial. And so that always prompts the notion of, well, what does that exclamation point really mean? Um, I had a student one time who very loudly, when I asked him to say, what is 4 factorial equal? And he shouted, 4. And uh, we all kind of chuckled. And I said, well, <laughs> um, he goes, no, that's what it is, an exclamation point. I just came from English class, and an exclamation point means you say it with emphasis, so it's four. And, uh, and I got to 24. But once the kids understood, and, and we talked about what factorial means, about multiplying that integer by all the consecutive integers down to one, so four times three times two times one, and that equals 24, it did open up a different set of numbers that they could use four fours to get to. So, um, so in this case, if... Uh, if, if you're looking for a, um, a, a way to get to, uh, to 19 here, it is 4 factorial minus 4 minus 
4 over 4. And it's OK if students never heard of a factorial before this, because what that does is that opens up at least an introduction to a new mathematical symbol, a new way of evaluating numbers, and then have them use the four fours to think about all the different ways they can use four factorial here. So just a little sense of um, how we could um, use something like four fours. And, and the other thing is, and I'm a firm believer in, in uh, using the, uh, the internet when possible to get a good answer here. I br I'm bringing up a Wikipedia page for you to see. Um, and these give all the answers from 1 to 20. So they are right there. There are a plethora of websites that are out there that work with 4-4s four and, um, and will provide numerous answers that go well into the hundreds using 4-4s. Four so this is certainly an activity, as, as I like to say, has a lot of legs around it. Um, and, and can certainly be done in a variety of different contexts. So that's all there. So I'm just going to pause for a minute if there are um, any questions. Um, Nathan, if you're seeing anything, or if you have anything to add or comments and such before we, we actually move on to a, to a little activity. No, at this point, there are no questions. Um, I'm just enjoying trying to figure out in the 19 myself. I, I actually, I'm, I'm looking at your, your uh, Wikipedia uh, page, and it looks like there is another one involving point four, which is very uh, creative. Yes, and thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely. So um, there are all of these different ways that as long as you adhere to the parameters of the activity, which is you can only do use four fours, if you want to do point four, or four tenths, if you want to do 44 hundredths, um, if you wanted to do 4 divided by 4 tenths, anything like that, um, and, and certainly encourage students to, to figure that all out, um, can be a, a great way to open up, open up the activity. So, okay. Well, um, Nathan, were you able to... Um, to send the activity or no? Uh, I did, you know yeah, I, I did send to everybody <laughs> okay. a, uh, well, I guess it's a little a PDF, okay. but um, I don't know how many people sure. had a chance to, to look for it. I apologize. I sent it out okay. basically right as the, uh, as the webinar was getting started. I realized um, I had a file I should send to everybody. So if you have a chance, uh, if it's convenient, uh, there is a table of values, at least I think I had the right table. I, I, I think my, I, maybe I sent the table that was describing the problem. I, I didn't quite look like what you have up here. So sure. I, so, yeah. so, I, so I, kind of, I kind of took some liberty and modified. Um, I just kind of uh, did this to kind of scope some things out. And I'm going to type a little bit as we're going through this. Um, but just to set it up for everybody that's out there, um, no, building number sense when it's done in context, we know is certainly a much more more powerful tool. And so, what uh, what we wanted to share with you for a little bit tonight is an activity around text messaging. So, we know that our students are digital natives; they are very adept at um, texting. At times, for some kids, it is a preferred preferred form of communication. I know even for myself sometimes it's a much more preferred form of communication, especially when uh, multitasking and there's just a lot of different things going on. Um, but text messages cost money. And, and certainly um, our, our various cell phone providers have um, established very successful businesses on not only just the, um, the phone plans, but the data plans and things that come along with it. And so um, we're going to use a, a fictitious company here. We're going to call it TextCo. Um, this is an activity which comes from our, uh, our Fostering Algebraic te uh, series with Casio Technology. And so what you see on the screen here is um, four different data plans. Um, and I'm going to add to this for a second because um, one plan is that a person would get charged 10 cents per text message. 
doesn't matter how many texts they send, uh, it is just 10 cents a text. Okay? Then if we come over here to this column, we've got a 250 messages plan. So what that means is that a person will pay a $5 fee for up to 250 messages, okay, plus 10 cents for each additional message. Okay, so a person is going to go ahead and text. They get the first 250 messages for $5, and then after that, it is 10 cents a message. So the 500 message plan is a little bit different in that there is a $10 fee for up to 500 messages plus an extra 10 cents for each additional message. And that would be for each additional message over 500. So might be a good time if we're kind of doing a, a quick check with our students to simply say, well, what, is that, what does that mean for you? What does that look like? So we want kids to understand that they could text anywhere from zero text up to 500, and it will cost them $10. But the minute they do one more text, and that would be 501, that, that 10 cents a text message then starts adding up. And then, of course, there's an unlimited message plan. And in this case, this plan is $20 you know, for month. So it doesn't matter how many messages um, they're going to go ahead and text, but it's $20. They could text 100 messages a month. They could text 5,000 messages a month. Um, and that's that. You may know of, of people who are, are very um, voracious texters. And uh, it's not uncommon for them to send out 100 or 200 texts in a given week, let alone maybe even a given day um, in that case. So, so what does this, this mean here? Well, what we want is we want to take a moment and fill in this table. So get a sense of what these different plans would cost. Now, we also want to think about that these plans are developed for a very particular purpose. So what might, um, what plan rather might be the most attractive for someone who doesn't text a whole lot in a given month? And what would, what would be the reasons for that? So take a moment and just kind of um, fill in this table a little bit. Um, either with the file that Nathan sent you or if you've got a piece of paper next to your computer, kind of scope some things out um, and let's get a sense of where all of these, um, these plans are. And I'm going to give you about a minute, no more than a minute or so to do that and, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll regroup. Yeah, John, I have a confession to make. Um, I, I didn't notice. I sent them the wrong table. There are like three tables in that section, and I misunderstood okay. which one you'd wanted. So they're probably better off just following yours on the screen. I mean, okay. they can That's clearly fine. make Great. their own. but Not a problem. That's perfect. Okay. So, so, um, so what we did here then is we're going to go ahead and we're going to scroll down. And here are the um, – here, here's the table drawn out. Um, what we're missing on this table, though, is um, just the disclaimers around um, the 250 messages plan, which, remember, we said was $5 for up to 250 messages. And then this, the 500 messages plan was $10 for up to 500 messages. And the unlimited messaging plan was just a... $20 um, for unlimited. So let's just pause for a moment, think about this table, and, and let's think about some of the data that we have in front of us um, to take a look at. Okay. So what would be the most important factors when figuring in a text messaging plan um, that you wanted to buy. So 
maybe you're kind of on the fence between two particular plans, what would be the one that would be best for you and for why? Well, again, that comes back to how much someone texts. Um, clearly, if there is someone who doesn't text a whole lot, um, the 10 cents per message or the 250 messages plan may be the most beneficial. But certainly, if, if someone is, um, is texting quite a bit, then maybe they just want to go with the unlimited plan. So there has to come a point in time when one plan truly is the best suited for the other. Okay? So what if we took a look at 400 texts? Let's use that as an anchor point in this discussion and say, okay, someone's going to go ahead and on average, they text 400 texts per month. What would be the best plan for them? Well, as I look across, this seems to be an awful lot. Okay, $40 a month for texting, um, when clearly, if I go over here, um, I could do $10 a month, and I would get 500 messages. I get 100 more messages a month. Okay, so if you're going to text 500 messages, and that's going to be the best plan for you, we want our students to think about, okay, well, how many texts does that mean per day? Okay, well, 500 divided by 30, I'm looking probably somewhere between 16 and 17 texts a day. Is that, is that good? It, it, does that fit in with my plan? If it does, this then becomes a very viable plan for me. If it doesn't, then um, if I know that maybe I'm more inclined to text 500 a month, well, look at that. That still holds true. That plan is still the best. Um, even if I were to text 600 a month, that 500 messages plan still seems pretty good. But what we don't see in the table, and, and I I think any time we present data to students, we need to be very, very particular and very focused about the data that we give them because we want that data to prompt some discussion. We don't have 650 listed here. We don't have 700 listed. We don't have 1,000 listed here. So, so does there come a point in time when that 500 messages plan doesn't seem to be the best benefit anymore? And that's what we don't see in the table. You may have students that may be more inclined to actually extend the table out. Um, what are we seeing here? Well, really, in its elementary sense, this is skip counting. This is skip counting back to what our elementary teachers do on such a regular basis as they're building number sense with students. They skip count by fives. They skip count by tens. And then as they're working on multiples, they skip count by, say, maybe fours or by threes, and sometimes maybe even by sixes and so on, that, that they're getting that habit in there. Well, I really believe we never lose that ability to skip count. So I'm looking at this table here saying, okay, for right now, 600 messages, I could go with either the 500 messages plan or the unlimited. But what my number sense has to tell me is that when I go beyond 600, that I really need to go to that unlimited plan. So it's one thing to see it in, um, in a table form. It is definitely another to see it in a graphical representation. So what I've done, and, uh, and if you've got your calculators here and you want to go on ahead and, and, and type these in to see this as well, I went ahead and I put in um, uh, some functions that we're going to use to graph to model uh, this text messaging problem. So what I went on ahead and did was in Y1 here, I put in the 10 cents um, per minute or per text plan, and that's Y equals 0.10x. Then what I did in Y2 was I created a, a piecewise function here for a range from 0 to 250. Um, and I did the same thing here and Y3 for 0 to 500. The 5 and the 10 represent the 
five dollars um, for the text from zero to two fifty, and the ten dollars from zero to five hundred on the second and third plans that we saw in the table. And then Y4 represents our unlimited texting plan at just $20 per month. Then in Y5, um, what we have here as well is, um, is we have a piecewise function. So we have 5 plus 10 cents times the quantity of X minus 250. Whoops. I apologize for that. I just lost my whole screen. Nathan, did you see that? Uh, actually, no, it looks like we're still seeing it, so I'm not sure what's going to happen. Okay, so, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and talk it, but Nathan, I'm going to ask you to take, uh, I don't know if it's going to help or not, um, <laughs> the joys of modern technology, my, my computer is actually shutting down. Um, so the good thing is, is that I called in. I can guide you through it. Indeed. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try to get this up, um, you know, as uh, as soon as I can. It's going through some kind of Windows update, which I don't know why it's doing that, but joys of modern technology. Understood. Anyway. <laughs> Understood. Okay, we will. Uh, anyway, right? Expect the unexpected, right? Yeah. Um, so so anyway, so um, so that Wi-Fi function. Is, is the piecewise function that has the $5 plus the 10 cents per text times the quantity x minus 250. And yeah. so we know that we want to prompt that from our students about what does that x minus 250 actually mean. Um, and, and so there's a, a comma after that. And then um, it is um, uh, in, in a set of brackets in the program, it is 250 comma 2000. Give me, so, give me one second. I'm actually going to try to type this in, although okay. I, th I thought I had it visible, but it looks like uh, maybe it's not anymore. I was hoping to actually type in what you had. Sure, do you want me to repeat the... Um, oh, you know, I know what happened. I know what happened. The minute I took control, I lost what you had... Uh, what you had ah, been. Okay. I, I actually, you know, your screen was still showing until I think I took control and then I wiped it out for everybody. So okay. I'm going to really quickly try to type everything in, which the good news is everyone will be able to actually see the end of the lines you were typing. So so remind me, we start off with uh, 10 cents a minute. Yep, so Y1 was the decimal point, 10x, okay. that represented the, um, the 10 cents per text in the first right. plan we looked at. Then Y2 was 5 comma bracket uh, 0 comma 250. Okay, 0. And so what that does is that just represents a, a constant value of $5 for um, 0 to 250 text. Okay. Okay, and then Y3 is 10 comma, right. bracket, zero, comma, 500. Okay, have that. Okay. Um, and then Y4 is 20. And that just represents the plan that was 20 text uh, um, unlimited. Understood. $20 for unlimited text. And then Y5 is 5 plus decimal point, one, zero, open parens, X, minus 250, close parens, comma, then a, a, an open bracket, 250, comma, 2,000. Okay, we have that. Okay, and then Y6 is a 10 plus decimal point, one zero, open parens, okay. x minus 500, okay, have that, close parens, comma, bracket, 500, to 2,000 also, to 
2,000 or so, yeah. Okay, done. Okay. Did you want me to adjust the color to match? Yeah, if you can go ahead and do that. So, um, so Y1 would be one color, and then um, Y2. Let's see, Y2 Y4, is red. Y5. Right, so Y2 is red. That's That needs to match up with Y5. So um, we'd been talking about this earlier before the webinar began. The, the way you can change, you can actually change the color of these. These are presets, but you can go uh, Shift and then Format right here on the 5 button. And it will take you in here where I can adjust the line color to, in this case, red, which is number 3. And hit Exit. And then I want this one, let's see, Y6 needs to be green to match Y3. So again, I highlight it, um, shift format, line color is number two, and green is number five, exit. Okay, so I think we have that in place, barring a mistake on my part. <laughs> Would you like me to graph it now, John? Sure, go ahead and graph it. Uh, and then it gives me a syntax error. Did I, by chance, let's see. Let me double check. Um, I've been known to use the wrong X variable, although that doesn't look I, like. I've done that, too. That, that's the problem with uh, typing on my computer. I, I always I have this bad habit of typing. Um, Let's make sure I have nothing else in here. And let's try that again. Oh, what did I do? Now I'm having trouble. Okay. Well, the good news is, is that my computer is back up and running. And uh, if all goes well in about 15 seconds, we can... Uh... Okay. Well, sorry about this, folks. We will... Uh... I'm going to do a little bit of troubleshooting while he gets his computer up and running. There you go. It won't even let me grab. Oh, there's the X. That's it. It's the very first X I typed in. I found it. Okay. I turned off everything and else. Do, do you have, um, what do you have your uh, view window set at? I, I have not even got that far yet. It's it's something oh, okay. from a from a previous moment. So right now there's nothing much interesting on there. I have one line. Well, but the good thing about that is, and uh, and and I know this was always a, a a struggling point for some of my students as well, was that setting a view window that actually fully represents the data in a given situation um, can be a great conversation for for a class around what should the X minimum be, what should the X maximum be, and same thing with the Y axis. Um, everything from the min to the max to what the interval actually looks like, and then even having kids pair up and compare um, how one set one view window versus another, um, because we want, we want to get a really, really good, good picture that's here. Um, what I had actually set on on my machine as far as a view window was concerned was that I set my X minimum to zero and I set the X maximum to 600. And the reason why we picked 600 was that that was as far as our data table went. So we were just going to showcase the data that we got in the, um, in the table. Now, really quickly, um, a couple things. First of all, are you ready for me to hand control back over, or are you still getting... Uh, you, can, you can hand control back over. Okay. I, I don't have them as nicely um, uh, color-coded as you do, but, uh, <laughs> but that's fine. You can, you can pass it over. Okay, I'll, I'll pass control over. Um, and as I do that, I, I, there's a couple questions came in while, we were, while my attention was diverted to this. Okay. So um, let's see. First of all, um, the question about the brackets setting up the intervals. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the answer is that, yes, the, uh, the brackets set up the interval on which it will graph that particular function. So when we did from 0 to 250, for instance, it will only graph that, func that function on the interval from 0 to 250. So you just put a comma after your, the function you want to graph, 
you use square brackets and you just and then you give it the, uh, the you know left and right bound. Um, let's see. That's so thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, it's easy to uh, take that for granted. Okay, so you have control now. So I have control, um, and uh, and hopefully for the next few minutes, my computer will not crash on this. Um, but uh, right, so here, so here's all our functions, and we went on ahead and graphed it, and so this um, this was the the picture that we got, and uh, and there are definitely some things uh, that we can talk about in regards to to the plan. So here's my cursor, or my pointer in this case. So here was our initial line. This was our ten cents per text. So certainly based upon the slope of this line, that for each text. Um, it's going to cost ten cents. We know that the cost is going to increase pretty rapidly. All right. Um, this red line here was our um, our two hundred fifty minutes, our two hundred fifty text plan rather that cost us uh, five dollars. And then after we got to two hundred fifty text, then this line, and this is the piecewise part of the function here as well, um, our ten cents increase. Interesting to note, this line is parallel to this line um, because our slope is the same. We're still spending that 10 cents per text. Same thing, here is our third plan that we talked about. This was our uh, 10 cents um, per text after 500 text messages. And here is our function represented with the 10 cents per text after 500, again, same thing parallel here. And then this line up here at the top um, was what it cost for um, $20 a month for unlimited texting. So if I was looking to see some intersections um, for where they might be, so here was our 10 cents per text. And then if I go to this line here, and you can see how we've constructed that. Whoops. My mistake, apologize for that. Okay, try one more time. Okay, so there's our first, and then we want to intersect this with, let's intersect this with Y4. Okay, so what this point here is going to tell us that when I compare the 10 cents per month plan versus the $20 unlimited text messaging plan, we get an intersection point because here's where these two lines um, cross. And what I'm shown here at the bottom of my screen is that when X represents 200 texts, my cost is going to be $20. So I can look at varying intersection points across this graph, and that can also help me determine what might be the best text messaging plan for a particular customer. A, a question uh, related yeah. to that is, um, when, when you do this, do you make a distinction between uh, cost per text for texts sent and received, or only for texts sent? Do you discuss that at all? Um, absolutely you can, and, and that's, that's another great question, because um, plans can vary. Sometimes they're just based upon sent, or they're based upon sent and received. Um, in this example, I believe we just focus on the number of text messages sent. But that certainly is a wonderful question to pose, because if we're being charged for both sent as well as received, um, that's going to basically, um, in theory, cut the amount of text down to about half that I could actually send out in a given month. So that's a great, great question to pose um, to your class and, and have them um, discuss amongst themselves and discuss with everybody about about that um, how that changes the context of the problem. Great question. Thank you. Do we have any others? Well, not so much a question, just a comment that someone is enjoying the ability to do piecewise functions. And although we lost the color coding, uh, you know, you could color code these so um, that. The red, for instance, is a continuous red. Um, right. Where, um, so that so that's also nice because uh, it makes it really obvious which functions go together. 
Absolutely, and and that's and that's something with which, um, in fact, um, in fact, I know you were doing it on on your end of the machine um, when when you had control over the screen to put that all together. But that's absolutely right. You can have that piecewise function just be one continuous color, um, and then that certainly makes the data very um, uh, very friendly in terms of being able to spot that on the screen. So. Um, Nathan, I think we want to be respectful of time. I think we've got just a few minutes left, if I'm, if my clock is correct. Good point. Um, but um, I just kind of wanted to read. Huh? I, I just said on my end, good point. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but I just wanted to recap a little bit about what we talked about um, over the course of, of these 50-plus you know, minutes here. Um, we really focused the discussion tonight on just a couple of ways to build number sense. Um, whether we um, engage our students in a problem like four fours, um, in, in truly being able to um, not just simply expose them to the four um, operations, but also to some various mathematical symbols we talked about, such as square roots and factorials and exponents. Um, but keep in mind that for some students, that may be completely new to them. And so learning a new symbol and what that equates to can, can be very powerful for them uh, in the scope of that four fours problem. And then we had an opportunity to take a look at one of Cassio's activities, which was this text messaging problem that, that really kind of tied in some very practical and, and, and a real world situation about different plans and figuring out which one might be best for a particular consumer based upon the, um, the amount of texting that they do in a particularly given month. Um, I do want to just conclude by simply saying that um, what I have found when I was in the classroom directly with students, and now what I find even more so in working with adults um, and the teachers across in the District of Columbia, is that having conversations around number sense um, have a lot of growth, they have a lot of strength, they have a lot of power and a lot of fuel for discussion um, that I'm sure everybody out there that's watching this webinar um, hopefully feel the same way. That you go back and you think about the conversations that you have around number with your students, with your colleagues, with your building, um, with the people who maybe you are a PD provider or instructional coach. Um, because when we talk about building a number sense foundation, just like we build a house, we need a really, really strong foundation in order to support that structure. And when we give our students a very strong foundation in number sense, it definitely makes their progression through all of the mathematics that they're going to do in the course of their lives, whether they go on to be psychometricians or uh, they simply are just you know, using math in their everyday lives when they're paying bills and balancing checkbooks and going shopping at the store and stuff like that, um, that there is a confidence that is grown by um, understanding and having a very strong sense of number. And so this is merely just the beginning of a lot more conversations that, that hopefully we'll take from this hour and, and have. So I want to thank everybody for their time and their attention. Thank you for posting the questions and sharing um, them with Nathan and with us. They were great questions. Um, again, we apologize for the little um, technology glitch on that end, but um, the great part about being a team with Nathan is that uh, we're able to just kind of bounce off of each other and, uh, and, still, and still make this happen. So um, thank you very, very much. Nathan, I'm going to turn it over to you to actually close out the webinar. All right. Thanks a lot, John. Um, so we do have a chance to answer any last questions. If, if anybody has any, they'd like to throw our way. Um, I, I want to share this link with you if you're at all interested. If, if I don't know how you came across the webinar. Several of your names I recognize. I know several of you have um, already gone through our training. However, if you're not yet aware, we do have a free online training course. Uh, several hours takes you through most of the features of the PRISM. And at the end of it, if you do complete the course and submit a few assessments, we are giving away 
uh, the emulator software that you saw John and I using this evening. So uh, it's a really nice opportunity. If you don't have it, it's, uh, it's I think, worth it. Oh, uh, one, one question that was asked earlier that I didn't get a chance to ask at the moment, but um, what do you think about using combinations and permutations with your 4-4s activity, John? That's an excellent, excellent idea. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's great. It's a fun way to branch it out uh, to you know higher levels. I was even thinking about, um, like, uh, what was I going to say? I was thinking... Oh, like logarithms or, you know, you could yeah. really get re very creative. Oh, my gosh, absolutely. Um, any, anything like that is, is wonderful and a great, great idea. I think it's, it's about how people take something, um, uh, no pun intended, as simple as four fours and running with it to um, tailor it to the specific and individual needs of their students and really pushing and challenging them challenging them to think about number in a lot of different contexts. I think that's great. Okay. Well, in the absence of any other questions, thank you again, everybody. Thank you, John. And uh, Thanks, we, we will be posting this webinar uh, on YouTube. If you're at all interested, uh, you can always contact me at naustin at casio.com. I can direct you there. Our, our webinar uh, Web page is, is under construction, so there's being some changes there, but things are getting posted very quickly to YouTube in, in the event that uh, you'd like to see them. Again, uh, my, my email address, naustin at casio.com. And thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Good night, everyone.